Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. We will now open up the discussions on this special day with Fred Eno, journalist, Pan-Africanist, crisis communications expert, and chef, who for many years was a personal assistant to the late Chief MKO Abiola. Fred, thank you for joining us. Good morning. Fred, can you hear me? Fred Eno is I joining us from our... loud and clear, Ruben. Good yes. morning. Okay. Uh, Fred Eno is joining us right now from our Abuja studio. Fred, happy Democracy Day, as uh, Nigerians are saying to one another today. But, uh, you know, Democracy Day... Happy Democracy Day to you, too. Yes, thanks. I... And today must have a very uh, special meaning for you. Uh, you were Chief Fabiola's uh, personal assistant for many years. Uh, you were part of the struggle for the actualization of democracy in Nigeria. Uh, you even went to prison. You were in uh, Enugu prison. Eventually, you had to go on exile. Now, how special is this day for you? And what, in your opinion, is the symbolism of the, uh, or the meaning of Nigerian government declaring today as Democracy Day? Thank you very much, Ruben. I, uh, I must say I'm really, really, really happy. It's uh, been almost 26 years now, and here we are celebrating a day that is beyond Moshuda Biola. This day is beyond Muhammad Buhari, let alone the Obasanjos or the Abachas or the Babangidas. This is a day that speaks to what the aspirations of Nigerians for their country is. This is a day that looks at how Nigerians expect their country to be, how they relate to one another. It is just beyond an election and a day that we want to celebrate as Democracy Day. It's a day that cuts our cross, our ethnic and religious cleavages, and brings out the best of Nigeria. That Moshuda Biola symbolizes that aspiration. It's something beyond um, the, 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 the day itself. It is something that speaks to what Nigerians, particularly at a time like this, would wish for the country that Abiola so loved. So for me, it's a celebration, but it's also a call to our inner selves as Nigerians. What is it that would make a market woman in Aba and uh, a, a, a headsman in, in Kaduna or Borno or any part of the country vote on the same sentiments? in which case a person voting from the East is voting not because Moshuda Abiola is from the East or from the Southwest or from the North, but because he brings to them something that says we have a shared value, we have a common interest, and we have a country we all belong to and should aspire to its greatest heights. Mm -hmm. So for me, there is, there is happiness for this day, but it's also um, a moment of deep, deep, deep reflections, especially when we consider where our country is today. Indeed, our national anthem has the line, the labor of our heroes past shall never be in vain. A lot of people are obviously mentioning my father um, today as a linchpin, the sort of flashpoint of the entire June 12th moment. But for somebody like you, who also struggled, who made personal sacrifices, you were incarcerated, you were intimidated, hounded, you lived in fear and had to leave Nigeria for fear of your life. Who are some of the people we should also be mentioning today? Because as you said, quite rightly, it's not all about MKO Abiola. Thank you very much and so glad to see you sitting down there. I don't have the luxury of Ruben, who is sandwiched on both sides by beauty and brain. Ah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I guess, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm the luckiest man on television. <laughs> <laughs> you, you bet, you bet. But, um, again, again, 
if if I were to begin uh, based on those questions, you 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 can't help but think about Kudira Tabiola. I mean, this is a woman, a young woman. She had the choice of sitting back as a wife with seven young kids and um, a family to, to care about. She went beyond her remit. It was not because Moshuda Biola was her husband. It was because she believed in the things that he stood for, which she also realized were good for Nigeria. So Kudira Tabiola comes to mind without even the flick of, um, of, of, a, of a coin. But it goes, again, beyond all of that. Don't, don't forget, um, Chief Rewane was murdered in the most brutal form, just like Kudira Tabiola was, and several others who were um, severely injured, businesses destroyed. I know people in the east, in the north, in the southwest, whose livelihoods were cut down simply because they identified with Moshuda Biola. Um, and it brings us back to things like Nadeko. I remember um, the day the Nadeko declaration came out and I was with Chifayo Kwadokun when they drew up this um, uh, declaration. I happen to have been lucky enough to be sent for the signature of um, uh, AB2 Kiwe. And I remember going to his residence somewhere in Victoria Island late at night for him to put his signature before this document was sent to the press. Actually, Tribune in Ibadan had stopped press just waiting for this document to arrive. And I took this to uh, Commodore Ebi Kiwe's residence. When he read it, they took it to him upstairs, and when he read it and was coming down, I saw tears running down his eyes. And he said, have all of those people read this document they signed? And I said, yes, sir, they did. And tears rolled down his eyes as he signed it and gave it to me to send it to the press. Now, some of these people are still alive, so we must celebrate them. I see um, across the country people of all creeds and religions and ethnic backgrounds celebrating this day. So all of those people have contributed. I saw earlier as you were flicking, I saw Lisa Bakoba, I saw Yinka, I saw several others that, that you raised. These are people who sacrificed, I would say even more than I did. You have the Kokoris and all of those people. But to me, the, the thing here is, yes, we have to celebrate this day, we have to acknowledge and recognize the contributions of these people, but the job is not done. Moshuda Biola is not staying where he is today, looking at us and saying, uh, thank you for celebrating me, and then we can fold our hands and go home. The job is not done. The country still needs even more sacrifices than some of us did. And if we have to go back to that creed you mentioned, that the labor of our heroes past should not be in vain, celebrating this day is the beginning of that recognition, that realization that June 12 is more than a day. It is an idea, and that idea is one that looks at a Nigeria that goes beyond, as I said earlier, our ethnic and ethno-religious cleavages. That is what June 12 is about. I happen to have run into the running mate of um, your dad, Chief Abiola, a day or two after the 2015 elections, I'm talking in the person of Baba Gana King Gibe. And he gave me a hug and said, finally, June 12 has come around. I was a bit taken aback, you know the history. But what he meant was that for once, you had an election again that kind of reflects what Nigerians were thinking about on June 12, 1993 with the election of General Buhari, given the widespread support that cut across the country in 2015 supporting his, his emergence. So when we look at who to recognize and who to, to, to acknowledge for having sacrificed, let's not get bogged down in celebration alone. 
the country needs June 12 now more than ever. And I think that's where I give it to General Buhari. Beyond who the messenger is or who took the action, for doing this now at a time when the country looks as broken as it is on ethno-religious lines, we're losing people every day for reasons that are totally out of our imagination. We need June 12 now. And for him to have thought of that and done it, I think it's a recognition and a realization that the unity of this country is beyond standing on pulpits and preaching it. You can't force unity on people. You can't force Mr. Anna, love on people. I, I, just so before something we go has to, to be done. Just before we go on a break, I'd also like to agree with you there. I'm personally profoundly grateful to the president for this gesture. But I wanted to just briefly say my perspective on what you referred to earlier about the history of June 12th, when you saw my dad's running mate, Baba Ghana Kingibe, I would like to say that I do feel that he's been misunderstood and mischaracterized in this whole June 12th struggle. I just, I would like to say that before we go on a break. I, I think you're very right. Um, but also, time has a way of bringing us to realizing some of the fault lines that we've, we've ignored. He's still alive. He has the opportunity of telling his own story. But um, it's, not, it's not about, like I said earlier, the personalities. June 12 is an idea, and that idea is, is an amalgamation of what is best of Nigeria from all ethnic and religious backgrounds. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Eno, for this. We do have to go on a break. However, shortly before we do go on a break, let's quickly speak about the vision of Nigeria, 20 years of uninterrupted democratic rule. Yet, do you believe that this is the Nigeria, of course, that uh, M.K. Abiola died for or was rather assassinated for? Is this the Nigeria that his life went for? And how do we need to start working towards envisioning and creating that Nigeria so that, really and truly, the labor of our heroes past shall never be in vain? I'll leave you with that question, and as soon as we are back, of course, the show continues, and we'll get your answer. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Now, Mr. Eno, before we went on a break, I was asking you about the statement that the labor of our heroes past shall never be in vain. And with 20 years of uninterrupted democratic rule, before Nigeria, let's speak about his vision quickly and what you believe his vision was and what Nigeria would have looked like under a potential Abiola administration. The fact that we are here 20 years later, uh, it's one small realization of um, Abiola's dream, which was to make sure that never again would we wake up and see a soldier on our television screens telling us that fellow Nigerians, I, Colonel or General A, Y, and Z, have or we have decided to steer the sheep of state, as they would normally say, in one form or another. So the fact that today we have a democratic system and the soldiers have realized that they have to subordinate themselves to the will of the Nigerian people rather than use the barrel of the gun to subjugate us to undue um, dictatorial governance is a realization of a small part of what Abiola aspired for Nigeria. Now, there's been debate about how well Abiola would have fared in an Abiola administration and all of that. I can say this for sure, that if Moshuda Abiola had taken the reins of power in this country, this country would not be what it is today. 
And people can argue with me one way or another, but they cannot dispute the fact that that is a statement I make with utmost uh, seriousness. And we can challenge it, but we cannot deny it. Now, if you look at his own life, his businesses, his, his approach, his, his pan-Nigerian-ness, and he, he never lacked or, or the, 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 he, he had that feeling that Nigeria had the capacity within its people to solve its problems and its challenges in a way that will suit and soothe the feelings and aspirations of every Nigerian. He had Igbos, he had Efix, he had Ibibios, he had Kanuris, he had Hausa Fulanis sitting in serious and high-level positions in all of his businesses. I mean, there were people in my, in Calabar, who assumed that I was a, a, a Yoruba man and I just had a, 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 an Ejagam name because of the way he functioned with me. So when you look at that, then you look at the kind of a Nigeria he would have ran, we certainly would not be where we are. Well, Secondly, there's an aspect of it that you also have to realize. Abiola did not start doing the things he did and waiting to become president before he would complete them. I accompanied him to Zangon Kataf in southern Kaduna when they had the most devastating ethno-religious clashes in that part of the country in 1992. He was not president. He was not even a candidate. In fact, he had not even made public his intentions to run for the presidency. And here we were going to Zangon Kataf, which had been devastated by, by ethno-religious clashes. He was a private citizen. He had no reason to go there. But he would go there and come back and call the president and say, Mr. President, are you aware that these are the remote causes of this problem and how do we help you in solving it? Right. Right. And when you see a man doing those sorts of things, right, he like, knew what he, right, he wanted like to interject here. And certainly that would have been different. Right, I would like to interject here. You said a lot about uh, uh, Chief M.Q. Abiola, his heroism, his martyrdom, his symbolism. And you've also talked about other persons who made a great sacrifice for Nigeria to be at this point today. I'd like, you to, uh, ask, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, beyond the heroes, are there also villains? You know, uh, because I know that many Nigerians talk about the villains of uh, uh, that June 12 uh, phenomenon. But before you uh, respond to that question, I would like to introduce Dr. Doyi Okupe, who has now joined us uh, in our studio in Lagos to uh, be part of this conversation. Dr. Doyi Okupe has been a special advisor, special advisor to two presidents, first President Olusha Gwambasujo, and then uh, President Goodluck Jonathan uh, until 2015. He's also a man who knows the late Chief M. K. Abiola very well, very closely. And in fact, he was with him on the day he was arrested after making the famous Ekpetedo Declaration on June uh, 24, uh, 1994, uh, at the Ekpetedo area in uh, Lagos. He's now here to help us also take a look at the Abiola story as he knows it. Good morning, Dr. Kupe, and welcome to the morning show. Good morning, Good morning. Dr. Yes, yeah. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to be here. So, Fred, back to you in uh, Abuja. Are there villains, uh, as you remember, uh, June 12? And if there are, who are those villains? What do you think about them? What did they do? Hello, Fred. And before carrying on to look for villains, let me, let me say hello to Dr. Kupe. Uh, uh, it's been a while. Um, Important as we look for villains, as I said, in Julius Caesar, um, some of the good are interred with your bones. You can't start digging up villains now. Dr. Kukwe, who's sitting down there with you, would remember very well that he was with the opposition in the 1993 elections, our opponents. And after the famous debate, when we came up the studios, both Moshuda Abiola and Bashir Tofa hugged and cracked jokes. Now, 
if we were to start looking at who the villains are and pointing fingers at an abacha or 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 uh, a an Al Mustafa or all of that, we will go nowhere. And that's not in the character of Moshud Abiola. I do understand the need for people to want to know who the villains are so they can carry the burden, but they still carry those burdens in themselves, whether we point them out now or not. What I think is most important is that when we see the chronology of events, Babangida annulled, Abacha arrested, democracy came, Obasanjo ignored, and of all people, Buhari brought us back to where we are. Are they heroes and villains in that equation? And I'm starting from the top. So we're going to have to come to that realization that if the villains have lived up to this day to see that what made them do what they do against the interest, if they thought they were doing it against Abiola, they were so mistaken. Because it wasn't against, Nigeria, against Abiola, it was against Nigeria. And so for me, if there were any villains out there, today is an opportunity for repentance. Today is an opportunity for us to forgive one another. Today is an opportunity for us to put, to put our ethno-religious cleavages aside and build a new Nigeria. Well, uh, Dr. Kukwe, you've been listening to Fred Eno. Um, I will have reminded him that he once said that those who were close to Abiola were the same persons who sold him out. And I will have gone further to ask him uh, to name those persons uh, so that, you know, today is not just about celebration. It's also uh, uh, a day of reflection, yes. But Dr. Kukwe, uh, how do you feel today on June 12th? What's your own impression? What's your assessment? And, you know, <laughs> how do you remember the man MKO Abiola? <laughs> It's, uh, for me, June 12 is uh, it's much more than celebration. Essentially, it is about the embodiment of a great man. Perhaps one of the greatest that was created in Africa. Ebenezer Obey had sung for a long time. Later in his life, he discovered that he was somebody who sang under inspiration. He sang a song, and I will never forget. And I've used it in certain quarters, especially when M.K. Abiola was um, incarcerated and Myself, Chegno Shoba, late Adin Jadili, and late uh, Wahab Dusumo, felt totally and completely miserable and impotent. And we felt that we had. Very strong word. Yeah, very serious, very serious. You know, it, it, you know, it was you know, extreme frustration and the feeling of overwhelming impotence. Abiola was a man that, I didn't vote for him. I didn't. But he won the election. And that's, for me, that's where it stops. You know, we went, we, we, we went to meet Baba Adesanya and his group. We sought for, we sought for, uh, the, I mean, we, we sought for a meeting and they granted us. And I sang that song at that day, that in the continent of Africa, there's only one Moshut Abiola. It's a treason. Do you want to sing the song? Yeah, In sorry. the continent of Africa, one, one Moshut Abiola, one MKO. Fact of life. And I told Baba, 
Well, I was, you know, uh, there were four of us, but I was asked to speak, to, to make the presentation. What we wanted to do was to find any means possible to get Abiola out of the grips of Abacha. You know, because everything else had failed. Nadeko, everything else has failed. I was the youngest, the youngest member of the 33 people that constituted. Well, uh, Dr. Kupe, if we just hold your thoughts there, we'll take a short commercial break and then you, we'll come back to you and you continue. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Kupe, yeah. yes, <laughs> good, was... good to be back, uh, you know, uh, on air. Uh, yes, uh, you were talking I about was, a city meeting. Yeah, so, you know, when we, when we, you know, four of us, my, I mean, two of us were former NRC members, uh, Chief Oshoba and Wahab were SDP members. But this was totally beyond partisanship. And uh, we were having difficulty, difficulties in, in um, making our elders then understand where we're coming from, that we Yorubans should do something or should do everything possible, you know, because, you see, we projected, four of us met, and we projected that if this thing goes on like this, it may actually eventually lead to the loss of life of M. Abiola, for which we will feel guilty and for which we will not forgive ourselves. So that was why we went and met those elders. But... You know, they, they felt that the proposition we're bringing will not work and that uh, the people we want to deal with are not reliable. So I then said, you know, in a fit of inspiration, I said, Baba, do you remember this uh, song? So just like you said, he said, you sing it. So I sang it. And I said, the army may have 1,000 apachas that the Southwest and Nigeria and Africa only has one MQ Abiola. And one, KM, uh, one MQ Abiola was by far much, much more than a hundred of Abacha. And therefore, it would be foolish, it would be inadvertent, it would be unreasonable to stake the life of Abiola against that of Abacha. Yeah. You seem you seem to be very um, passionate about the late MKO. There's no alternative for me. There is There's no none. alternative. Now you worked I have with two past administrations. Here that I don't break down here. I can't. You know this. This is it. This is. You won't, sir. It's all well. You worked with two past administrations in the government: uh, the Obasanjo administration, the Jonathan administration. My question to you has to do with the symbolic homage being paid by the Buhari administration now to the late MKO Abiola, and why no other past administration, correct me if I'm wrong, made any sort of effort to pay this kind of homage. The only administration that can pay this type of homage to Abiola is this administration that is in. Yes, I'll tell you. Because you must understand the sentiments and the hypocrisies that bedevil the politics we play in Nigeria. If a Yoruba man had, you know, had done it as president, it will not be that well received. And, you know, it may... Let me tell you what happened. Even the, the MQ Abiola struggled itself which culminated in the formation of the NADECO, all right, later on became a sectional struggle. You know, Abiola, haven't broken this, you know, there are two major problems in the country, politically, ethnicity and religion. And they've been there ever since pre-independence. And we still have not been able to overcome them, even in this administration and in these times. You understand? Abiola is the only Nigerian that broke the p these two pillars, broke the pillars of ethnicity and broke the pillars of religion. And that's what culminated in what June 12 is all about. 
There's no other, no person has done it. No person has capacity to do it. No person probably will be able to do it in no, future. Not to do it, but to pay homage to So that's, so did. the point I'm trying to say is that Southerners will naturally find it. You know, what we say in, when we're in power and when we're in government, you know, is moderated and modulated by various considerations that we do not admit outside. Do you understand my point? I'm telling you, you know, Ruben knows what I'm talking about. This is how government, government is not a very, very honest, uh, sincere business. All right? But people just try to make things work and to, you know, to sort of sort out many things. I, I mean, uh, our personnel could not have been able to do it. All right? Uh, Southern politicians, Southern presidency, for instance, you know, Jonathan also would not have been able to do it because he had his own issues that he also wanted to balance and sort out with the North. So, you know, people really do not know how Northerners really feel about this June 12. Because when, the, you know, after Abiola broke those two ceilings and people vote, I mean, voted massively according to their consciences and their likeness for the gentleman, when the struggle started, a lot of, I mean, the, 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 the sectionalism, not religion this time, sectionalism came in. Ethnicity came in. It became, it dovetailed into a Yoruba struggle. And that's what frustrated that struggle. So that is a consideration that will always mar the patriotic moves that we make in this country. And that was why Southern political leaders like uh, Abbas Sanjo and Jonathan may not have been able to do it. And if they did it, it would be controversial and will not have the same acceptability as it, you know. As I said, you know, it is, the, it is uh, a Buhari government, a whole, I mean, a, an evidently northernly uh, padded administration, all right, that, and, you know, a man that has uh, a control and followership that is strong in the north, if he now does it, now, majority of Northerners will back it. Of course, Southerners who wanted it before will, will you know, will, you know, they will raise it up. Dr. Okukwe, let's yeah. go back to Fred in Abuja. Fred, are you there? Fred. Fred, yes, sir. Uh, yes, I am, Ruben. Thank yes, you very much. And I am a bit taken uh, aback by uh, Dr. Okukwe's comments here. Okay. You want to... Uh, Make some comments on the what president you said. of Nigeria is the president of Nigeria. From the outside, if, if President Obasanjo wanted to do it, he would do it. If President Goodluck Jonathan wanted to do it, he would do it. So let's separate. The whole northern, southern thing, and who chose to do it or not to do it. And like I was responding to your earlier question about this not being the time to choose villains, or my often reported statement of those closest to Abiola having to have contributed to, to um, his demise or the demise of the elections. Dr. Kukwe mentioned the names of those with whom they gathered uh, to try to get Abiola's release and all of that. In all of the names he mentioned, they were all from the Southwest. Does he know how many people from other parts of the country, including the North, who spared no effort at their own risk to seek for Abiola's release? So when we talk about sectionalizing and giving it ethno-religious colorations and all of that, I'm sorry to say, but then we are either trivializing June 12 or we are trivializing the efforts of this man. If Moshuda Biola, the Moshuda Biola I knew and worked for and worked with, were to be out and somebody else was a symbol of this democratic struggle, and he was from the North, he would not sit back and say, oh, let Northerners go and do it. So I am, I am trying to be very clear. And that's why I said, let's not go into the issue of looking for who the villains are now. 
June 12 is big. And it's even bigger than Moshe Abiola himself. Let me, let, me, let me kind of give you a little scenario here. In the process of the campaign, Moshe Abiola knew that winning the elections alone was not going to be enough for the military to give up power. But the one thing he also knew and said this to me and I guess a few others was that if he let the politicians and all those who were totally politically inclined and not seeing the bigger national interest in what he was doing, know that the military were not prepared to just give up power even if he won the elections. They will all desert him and then continue looking for favors from Babangida. Right. Let's so he made up his mind that we're going to win this election against all odds. And the odds were not political. The odds were not because he thought Bashir Tofa would defeat him. No. Right. He knew the hurdles that were being put to truncate the electoral process. Well, Fred, um, you know, I, I wanted to ask you a question about elections. Yes, we had elections on June 12, Please go ahead. Uh, 1993, and uh, everybody said it was the freest and the fairest election ever held in Nigeria. Now, have we learned any lessons since then, since the exit of the military? But we'll take a break, and then we'll come back to you so that you can respond to that question. 